Hello, everyone. Hope everyone is doing well. This is the uh, uh, Canadian Foreign Policy Hour, and I'm uh, Eve Engler. Hello, everyone. Hope everyone is doing well. This is the uh, uh, Canadian. I'm coming to you from uh, uh, Jojage, uh, otherwise known as Montreal, which has long been a meeting place of various First Nations. The Canadian Foreign Policy Hour is a uh, critical look at uh, developments in, um, in Canadian foreign policy. And I think it's about the uh, 75th, around 75th, 80th, something like that, uh, weekly, uh, weekly session. Uh, so today, a couple hours ago, uh, the UN Security Council 13 in favor and two abstentions voted for a UN mission to Haiti. Well, it's not exactly a UN mission. It's not, um, it's Security Council approved, but it's not formally under the UN. Uh, so it means that member countries don't have to pay for it. Uh, voluntary contributions. Uh, Russia and China abstained and uh, all the other countries voted in favor. And um, this is, of course, a, a long process that Canada was right at the center of in terms of pushing for a UN force. Uh, Kenya is going to be leading it, about a thousand Kenyan uh, troops. Um, the US is going to be funding, I think, an article I saw say $200 million. Presumably, Canada will be putting up money as well. The um, Victoria New Newland. Uh, acting Deputy Secretary of State in the U.S., said uh, this additional security support for Haiti goes hand-in-hand hand with the work that Prime Minister Ariel Henry is leading to forge a national consensus on a political path forward. So this is, of course, uh, Ariel Henry has no legitimacy. He was basically appointed by the U.S.-Canada core-led core group uh, with a tweet. And... Um, this is uh, what it's going to uh, what it's going to support. It's a one year mission, and um, it does. There's the, the starting point hasn't been decided yet. Uh, so um, so we'll uh, what date they're talking about? Um, uh, January first. There's going to be a, a a conference. A bunch of the Caribbean media is reporting on this now uh, on October 18th and 19th in Ottawa with the Caribbean community. And presumably that's gonna be about Canada with some CARICOM countries trying to figure out, uh, I guess, how Canada can support the Caribbean countries sending uh, troops and police uh, and or about uh, Canada doing uh, sending troops and police or something like that. Uh, so, so, um, yeah, we'll see where this goes, but uh, on the surface of it, this is going to strengthen Henri's hand and is going to deepen foreign control over Haiti. But of course, the situation is uh, not very good uh, security situation in the country, uh, but it can always get worse. And U.S. Canadian power can 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 be uh, strengthened when it needs to be uh, needs to be re um, uh, reduced. Uh, Canadians for Justice and Peace in the Middle East put out a report, How Canada Facilitates Israel's Annexation of Palestine, which looked at uh, the Canada-Israel Free Trade Agreement and how it, it uh, reinforces Palestinian dispossession. Uh, people can take a look at that. Uh, I was on the website of uh, the uh, uh, Federation, CJA, the Montreal uh, Jewish Federation today, and they had a uh, upcoming events, one uh, for teens on uh, planning the summer trip to Israel. And apparently there's nine different groups. They have some like, uh, I guess, uh, kind of fair with, with parents and I guess the teenagers themselves can come. There's nine different groups that present <laughs> that all offer different types of trips to Israel. Um, and uh, another uh, upcoming event, this is coming come up in like 10 days, another upcoming event was uh, how to be, how to become a pro-Israel advocate. Um, so just uh, uh, these events mostly don't get challenged, but they should be. Um, 
the the uh, the Jewish Federation uh, and the uh, the community center, the Cummings Community Center uh, in in uh, here in Montreal, uh, are putting these uh, these events on. Um, the head of the Canadian military announced a few days ago that he was being asked. Uh, the DND was being asked to find a billion dollars in savings alongside the uh, the Treasury Board uh, uh, looking for savings across, I think it's looking for 15 billion in savings across um, the different government ministries that a billion dollars from from DND. Uh, that's been a hue and cry. The media has just gone completely uh, uh, freaked out about this idea that that DND would be asked to find some uh, some money to uh, to cut, uh, even though it's 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 happening across across the uh, across the government and and the framing of some of the stories and framing this is like you know Canada's reputation global reputation is being smashed because uh, the Treasury Board is looking for savings in all the different ministries across uh, across the government. Um, there was a story in the Journal de Montréal titled La Propagande Chinoise Plus Menaçante Que Jamais. So uh, Chinese propaganda more menacing uh, than ever. And uh, it was based upon a uh, State Department uh, document or announcement that, uh, that China has ramped up its global uh, uh, propaganda uh, work. Now, of course, um, I'm sure it uh, doesn't surprise me if China has done that. That the Chinese government is is uh, is increasing its global uh, you know information uh, uh, operations. Um, that makes you know that's as it becomes uh, wealthier and certainly as it responds to the U.S.'s growing bid to uh, contain its contain its rise. Uh, I think obviously the Chinese would want to. Uh, strengthen their hand in the information sphere. Now, of course, the US uh, led propaganda, global propaganda apparatus is infinitely more powerful than the, uh, the Chinese one, or for that matter, the Russian one. And, um, and uh, you can see that in all kinds of different, uh, different ways. And that has both, you know, direct US government uh, elements to it, and then just sort of broader um, uh, dynamics that kind of flow from there. And also, of course, the Canadian government has a, you know, international uh, media uh, uh, propaganda apparatus that puts out a pro-Canadian uh, perspective uh, 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 globally. Um, the the um, uh, Canada Files has a story titled Michael Chong as the U U.S. point man for Canada-China policy. The the uh, the uh, conservative uh, foreign critic, partly based upon his his uh, his uh, testimony to the U.S. Congress uh, about ten days ago or so, and uh, just how how kind of hawkish Chong has been on um, on on uh, China and uh, um, really following uh, Washington's kind of uh, get tough on China. Uh, it's worth a, it's worth a read. The Financial uh, Post, the business section of the National Post, published a piece titled uh, on the front page, Questions Linger Over Foreign Investment. And um, it's based on the Canadian government's curbing uh, non-like-minded nations uh, in investment in, in particular minerals and sensitive minerals. And basically the story is, is sort of getting the the, the corporate world or the mining sector's uh, response to these efforts. And I've, I've brought this up before about how the mining industry has really pushed back some of the most nefarious um, uh, Canadian uh, mining companies, Barrick Gold, uh, uh, people like uh, uh, Freeland, um, I'm forgetting his first name right now, um, Toxic Bob, Bob, uh, Robert Freeland. Uh, um, the, they've, they've, uh, They've pushed back against these, you know, these are real like hawkish players in Canadian foreign policy, but they're hostile to these efforts to to uh, bring in kind of like geopolitical and, and so-called security uh, considerations because they want to just make money, sell to China, have 
great relations with Chinese companies. And uh, so, so when the Trudeau government brought in legislation restricting that, but a year ago, the that of course angered uh, some important uh, uh, mining uh, uh, players. And uh, and so the story kind of quotes, uh, basically quotes some companies that are still upset with uh, with Canada's policy. And and part of what Canada's policy has done is that it it, it gets even you know Canadian listed companies that not are not operating in Canada. But have but have assets that are deemed strategic in other countries, like in in Argentina and Chile, and uh, it restricts their ability to operate with um, with uh, with Chinese uh, companies or sell to Chinese uh, uh, firms, which is pretty uh, pretty outrageous considering it's not they're not even you know Canadian uh, uh, based um, uh, minerals. Um, on the on the sort of China uh, file, um, the there's uh, uh, the the uh, National Post had a piece titled "Liberals Pick Their Foreign Foes, Act Like Lions to India and Lambs to China." So so this is Terry Glavin pushing this this argument that that uh, we, the liberals have been soft on China. And but they're 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 you know real tough on on India and Glavin in his in his really kind of like over the top uh, uh, framing on both China file and on you know the, from the flip side on the India question the whole India assassinating uh, a Sikh a Sikh um, uh, leader in in Surrey BC uh, which of course people know uh, Trudeau says was. That the Indian government was in, implicated in this assassination, which I tend to uh, take as trustworthy. Though, of course, we should they have to they have to offer more evidence than what's been put in the public domain. Um, Derek Glavin, in a post, I don't think this wasn't actually in his National Post article, but on his uh, uh, Medium or or uh, on on his own blog. Uh, he says, quote, whatever else might be said about the continuing catastrophe, catastrophe of Trudeau's Modi killed the Canadian exercise in changing the foreign interference channel from the, from the benefits the Liberals accrued, accrued from Beijing's election monkey wrenching in 2019 and 2021. So he's, he's, he's explicitly saying that, well, the, that they're, they're, they're accusing the Indians of the assassination to to justify, to sort of diminish the foreign interference question of China, which I do believe it does. Of course, when you when you talk about Indian India's interference, that lessens the sort of panic that the media is trying to do around China, Chinese interference. So I, I totally agree that that is one of the impacts. But he's going a step further and 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 saying that that this is why the liberals have 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 raised this issue, and that it was a way of the the hiding the fact that China helped them win the election in 2019, 2021, which no one is really saying. My understanding is that that's not, um, that they wouldn't even, even if you believe the most maximalistic claims, it wouldn't have actually impacted the election. But uh, Glavin is all in on this, on this uh, question. And, and, uh, and he's, he's really into uh, mocking the, the, uh, um, the re reliability of of uh, the claims around India's uh, uh, involvement. Uh, the leader of the NDP, Jagmeet Singh, says he was briefed uh, by Canadian intelligence on uh, uh, India's involvement, and he, of course, uh, believes trusts the intelligence agency. Uh, he 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 has been sort of you know he's obviously uh, uh, very critical of the Indian government. Um, and so this was this is to be expected, but nonetheless, he is he is saying he saw the confidential information. And there's been a number of reports coming out uh, over the week, further kind of evidence, uh, other countries uh, kind of corroborating what the what the Trudeau government's been saying, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now, there are some debates like uh, uh, Dimitri Lascaris published a piece titled Is Biden Using Canada to Make India Look Bad? Which is kind of suggesting that that this may not be uh, fa founded, and this is about the U.S. wanting to uh, target India. I don't. This I, this doesn't make sense to me. Uh, um, 
at all. Uh, it's not impossible, uh, but um, there's a, I think that the evidence, the five eyes would much prefer to, uh, to deepen relations with India as a counterweight to China than they were, than they are in terms of getting into more of a conflict with India. So I, I don't, I don't buy that. Um, kind of coming from a different direction, the breach has a, has a piece titled Canada has ignored India's targeting of Sikh activists for too long. And it's basically arguing that uh, Modi's government in India is a really, you know, uh, sort of fascistic, uh, Hindu nationalist, um, and, uh, and in fact, uh, Sikh communities have been uh, complaining about interference and, and, um, and sabotage for a long time, and the government's taken a, a kind of hands-off approach. So we, we hear all this stuff about, about uh, uh, Khalistan and, and Canada enabling these sort of, you know, uh, secessionist uh, movements, uh, Indian secessionists, of course, the Khalistan movement wants a, a sick state in the Punjab and northern, northern India. Um, and, uh, but, he, but the point of the breach article is to say, no, what, what we've really, the, what's been missing from the discussion is is the fact that India has been so involved in kind of sabotaging and and, and targeting uh, Sikh activists in Canada. Um, so I, I I definitely am inclined to believe the basic outlines of what's being uh, uh, said around uh, the the Najjar uh, uh, assassination. Though of course there still needs to be more um, evidence to come out and. Uh, um, and uh, you know, obviously, the police and whatever that process needs to uh, to play itself out. Uh, shifting gears to uh, the NATO proxy war, the the uh, New York Times published a piece, I think, on Thursday, uh, says that Russian forces have gained more territory in Ukraine this year than the Ukrainians. So, despite the big counteroffensive, it's actually Russia that's gained more territory. And they've gained 331 square miles, while Ukraine has gained 143. Um, so uh, obviously that puts the whole counteroffensive into a, a different light. I think the, the Economist had a piece saying that the, the uh, Ukrainians have gained 0.25% uh, of the territory that they had uh, lost in this counteroffensive. Um, and, uh, but their conclusion, of course, is, is not to uh, to push for negotiations, but in fact to uh, to prepare for the fighting to go on, go on kind of like indefinitely. Um, the Wall Street Journal had a piece uh, titled uh, uh, "Ukraine has become the world's largest arms fair," and Zelensky had this conference. Where he's trying to get more uh, NATO countries to set up their or companies to set up operations in Ukraine. And it's just about how much sort of testing and knowledge and, um, for weapon makers that's come out of the, the fighting in Ukraine. Uh, uh, grim stuff, but uh, that's where we're at. The New York Times had a piece titled um, a U.S. Army Hospital in, Germ in Germany Quietly Aids Americans Fighting for Ukraine. So mostly former U.S. soldiers fighting in a supposed private capacity. When they're injured, they're being taken to a uh, U.S. military facility in Germany, uh, which certainly uh, undermines a little bit of the idea the U.S. is not involved in the war. What the story also points out, though, uh, that at the facility at that time, the, they say there's also there's soldiers from Canada, Britain, New Zealand, and Ukraine. So there was at least one uh, Canadian who was being treated at this facility when the New York Times um, uh, went there. So that's um, you know further. Uh, I mean, just how you know more about Canada's involvement and and uh, you know who knows how it works, how the Canadian gets because it's obviously uh, these are but you're, they're getting better big part of the point of the story was that they're getting much better um, uh, health treatment there than they are in Ukraine, which has very li limited and overwhelmed uh, um, uh, capacities uh, on the health front to treat um, 
be uh, injured. And this story online, just as we as Twitter is seeing about just you know, further evidence, but just the country is becoming a country of of um, of young men with broken off limbs, and just a photo of all these Ukrainians with um, missing limbs, and uh, this is this is just going to have a large impact on the country for years, decades to come, uh, and will obviously be part of the whole burden um, of the war from a Ukrainian and, and to a much lesser extent, also, I think, from a Russian uh, uh, perspective. Now, to the main issue that I want to delve into tonight um, is the Nazi gate and uh, <laughs> this thing that uh, we talked about last week, but has obviously just kept going all week. And um, turned into really a global uh, a global scandal. Now, what I thought I would do is mostly just talk about what some of the omissions of this of the of the Nazi Gate discussion, because there's obviously been lots of discussion, front page of the paper for multiple days. Uh, the one very important uh, uh, omission is. The Russian losses during World War II. Now, the speaker in parliament was very clear, Rhoda, that he wanted to celebrate killing Russians. He said that in parliament and then in his apology. And yet, in the all of the discussion, I, I don't know if I saw any story that mentioned what happened to Russia during World War II. And it was horrible, right? Hitler was deeply anti-Soviet, deeply anti-Slavic. That goes, you know, in his uh, in Mein Kampf, he's very clearly uh, hostile, racist, if you like, um, towards and and part of his project was displacing Slavs to give uh, land for German settlers. That was part of his project detailed back in the mid-1920s before he, he um, comes to power. And um, the official USSR statistic is, I think, 11 million soldiers killed and 16 million uh, civilians. And, you know, the things like the siege of, uh, of uh, St. Petersburg, which went on for like, I think, two and a half years, they say like one and a half million people died because of the <clears throat> the siege the starvation i mean just horrible horrible things the russian ambassador into canada put out a statement talking about some of this stuff and and saying that there's 200,000 according to them there's more than 200,000 russians in canada russian descent in canada and that they deserve an apology but justin trudeau in his apology he literally apologizes to everyone right uh Jews, Poles, LGBTQ, uh, the U U Zelensky Ukrainians, apologize to everyone, but doesn't apologize to Russians. But like the the Speaker of the House is really clear. I'm we're selling this guy because he killed Russians, right? That's what <laughs> that was the point. Um, so Russians don't get an apology, and um, in fact, Trudeau doubles down, right? Both his supposed apologies he talks about russian propaganda russian disinformation so he 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 boosts the russophobia that in large part underlies this whole celebrating a nazi with two not one two standing ovations in the house of uh house of commons um and that's tied to this you know the russophobia in canadian which I, I published in a piece, you know, this is, this is longstanding. This is more than Canada has been in, in a sort of effective war with Russia for a century and a half more, right? Since Crimea in the mid 19, uh, 1850s, Canada, the British soldiers based here and many Canadians went to go fight with the British, uh, invade in, in 1917. That's ostensibly about restarting an Eastern front during World War I, but Canadian troops get dispatched a couple of months after the end of World War I. Uh, you know, refusing relations, diplomatic relations with Russia throughout the 20s and 30s, or only a short period there. Uh, the Cold War, you know, what if you look at what 
you know, U.S. use of nuclear weapons in Japan. That was partly about threatening Moscow. Uh, they part of why they were supportive of Hitler, Mackenzie King, and 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 European elites was because he was anti-Soviet. He was anti-Moscow. Uh, then the Cold War. Then the you know, Soviet Union uh, dissolves, and and immediately we're trying to push. Uh, anti-Russian nationalism and all across Eastern Europe. I mean, throughout the Cold War, we're, we're, we're doing that as well, of course, trying to undermine the Soviet Union uh, through pushing Eastern European uh, nationalism. And then, you know, NATO expansion after, after the end of the, the Soviet Union. So the, you know, Canada, there's a deep, deep anti-Russian uh, ethos in Canadian uh, uh, political life. No one's talking about this, of course, in all of this, uh, which this, this, this whole... Um, Nazi gate really kind of brought brought forward. The other important thing not talked about, I just published a piece on the Ukrainian Canadian Congress, right? You know, Yuroslav Honka is uh, he represented them. He, he's he listed on their website as a as a supporter. He's donated there annually every year since 2013 to the UCC. He represented the UCC at a at a, a, a convention in in Kiev in 2003. He was awarded, given an award by the UCC in 2007, alongside many other members of his um, uh, Nazi uh, SS um, uh, force. Um, and so the UCC is like, hard, like no scrutiny of the UCC. They put out a statement, hilarious statements, worth taking a look at, that, that about this six days later. That's just like, it doesn't say really anything. It just sort of says, <laughs> doesn't mention his name uh doesn't mention parliament but it's a uh, it's very cryptic uh statement responding to this uh to the whole thing now the ucc well what about the ucc the ucc is this hard line uh you know was trying to break up the soviet union uh dur during uh the, you know from from the well before, you know from way back when um uh, it, it's been pushing very anti-Russian uh, Ukrainian politics uh, for decades now, you know, since independence. Uh, if you look at the UCC's role in the Orange Revolution in 2004, uh, they send all these election observers. And, and it was like even um, that Matthew Fisher, right wing uh, National Post, Post Media, Reporter, he talks about being there in Ukraine and, and during the Orange Revolution and being in this like embarrassing. The 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 ostensibly uh, independent Canadian election observers are all wearing orange shirts and are like right at the center of the Orange Revolution while they're supposedly observing the election. And they play this really important role, Canada and the Canadian ambassador and Canadian officials, but also the UCC in 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 that whole um, sort of pro West quote unquote Orange Revolution. Uh, Yanukovych, they try to undermine Yanukovych right away when he does get elected in, in 2010. And, um, and then Paul Grodd, the Maidan protest, pushing that early on, uh, uh, you know, bad-mouthing the Minsk II uh, peace accord. So they've been pushing this hard line policy for many, many years uh, within Ukraine. And... Um, and 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 uh, and and you know have been promoting uh, these these Nazi soldiers, right? They they put out statements. They've been tons of events that they've held uh, have celebrated. Uh, have the have the um, logo of of the of the Galician division. Uh, they put out Remembrance Day statements, um, uh, bas basically saying these forces. They call it always called the the uh, First National Ukrainian Army Army Division, which apparently they. The, uh, the 14th uh, SS uh, Waffen changed their name right at the end of the war, right before they they uh, they gave up. Um, they surrendered to the to the uh, to the Allies. They changed their name to a uh, First Ukrainian Army National Division, um, and uh, and so they celebrate them in their in their in their uh, press statements. They even they were even pushing to get these former Ukrainian. <laughs> Uh, forces that fought with the Nazis to, to get like pensions as former Canadian soldiers. Uh, they uh, um, so the UCC has got their hands all over this affair and and no no scrutiny. Uh, 
another part to all this that I thought it's worth uh, talking about is, is actually some of the left, like, you know, the media and the politicians are, of course, trying to frame this as just as like a little oopsie do, oopsie do, little error that has no sort of like political meaning. And, um, and the left, most of the commentary on the left, obviously is not going along with that and is talking about, you know, the roots of this. But, but I, I would say very much domestic, domesticizing the roots of it, right? So framing this as like a sort of domestic kind of issue. And, um, and I, what I, when, I, when I say that, what I mean by that, so okay, a few things about it. So for instance, you know, there's a bunch of posts, lots of talk about how the, 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 the former, uh, you know, Nazi, uh, either Nazi forces or Nazi aligned you know, far right Ukrainian uh, fascist forces, um, that they were, you know, thousands of them uh, were, were brought into Canada after World War II. And, um, and, they and the posts from a left perspective often talk about how they were brought in to undermine the large uh, uh, left wing communist so socialist Ukrainian Canadian community at the time. That's correct. And that's important history. And they also brought in in cases uh, and were used to break strikes, right? In Sudbury and 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 there's you know reports from the time uh, about that. Uh, so that's obviously important history and should be should be talked about. Um, and but part of it also gets into this whole. Um, I think it's kind of like underlying it is is this idea that that the Canadian elite dalliance with fascism. Is is like a threat to us. That's kind of I think a big sort of underlines a lot of what the left kind of criticism of all this is. Is that you know so we're willing to work with fascists and stuff. And and again that's you know I think true. It's, this is you know, we we should be very concerned about uh, the Canadian political elite's willingness to to turn fascistic. I think if, if there's if there's a real you know organized working class socialist economic democracy whatever you want to call it. Uh, uh, movements that start threatening capitalist control. I think they, they, the Canadian elite are prepared to go, you know, in the in a in a in a, in a fascist direction, and they have they have right. I mean, you know, you know, breaking strikes with the military and stuff historically, um, uh, not to mention you know how how they respond to uh, First Nations uh, protests and and resistance. But but um, so. So that's, I think, part of what's underlying it. Now, these these people weren't brought in, uh, like just you know from a. I mean, it was obviously a domestic element, but it was a geopolitical element. This is this is gets lost in that discussion, right? If you look at um, how the the, um, the whatever it's the Shen uh, committee uh, in the mid nineteen eighties that justifies the do nothing approach to to the. Uh, uh, former SS soldiers in Canada, they're very clear that like these people, they didn't join because they they supported the Germans. They 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 joined because they hated the Russians and they hated the communists, and so that's the justification for uh, allowing them to stay in Canada and not you know ruffling any fe feathers. Uh, so they're very clear it's an anti-Russian. Also, this is about you know the guy, the main player in pushing to get. Tens of thousands of Ukrainians, almost entirely uh, far right Ukrainians, Nazi aligned Ukrainians, into Canada after World War II, some, some like 30,000, is a, a Canadian military officer, Ukrainian background, Bod Bodan Panchuk. Okay, well, Bodan Panchuk, after fighting the Canadian military uh, 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 flight lieutenant during World War II, he 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 goes to work with uh, CBC International Service in the Ukraine section, right? So the Canadian government sets up a propaganda tool to pump in sort of Ukrainian nationalist, anti-Soviet, pro-Canada kind of propaganda into Ukraine. Um, so so these these you know Ukrainian nationalists were 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 cultivated. As part of an anti-Soviet, right? They didn't return them to this. They didn't send them to the Soviets to face, you know, trial by the by the USSR. They Britain brought them to Britain, and then eventually get get brought to, to Canada. So that sort of geopolitical, even from that historical 
uh, element is kind of is kind of uh, uh, pushed out by even a lot of left wing um, sort of uh, commentators on on recent uh, Nazi Gate, and uh, and obviously, I mean, if you look at the context today of why this happened, this was you know this was like the hyper jingoism of the NATO proxy war, and and we're just celebrating fighting Russians, and in our in our gusto of celebrating fighting Russians. Uh, the speaker makes a little bit of an error and brings in a guy that uh, that uh, you know has a bad public relations uh, cost, um, and uh, so 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 this is not a this is not about like domestic fascism, right? And then and then to go further with that, you know, I I, I wrote this two two years ago in a piece that like it's almost a principle of Canadian foreign policy to support far right fascistic groups, right? And, and, you know, I went through it in, this, in the piece, I'm not going to go on details, but like, you know, in in uh, in Venezuela, right? The Voluntad uh, Popular, we, basically street thugs. That's what we were supporting, the, the guys behind the garambas, the, you know, killing Chavistas and, and, and trying to overthrow the government like that. They were really marginal. Leopoldo Lopez, very marginal in, 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 in winning. Uh, they got, they were like the fourth biggest, uh, you know, um, 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 the self-appointed a Juan Guaido, that Juan Guaido's political party, right? They were marginal, their fourth fourth biggest uh, opposition party in, in Venezuela, but they were basically like the street thugs. That's who we that's who we back the fascistic forces. Same kind of thing in in Haiti with the with the Martelli, right? Uh, uh, obviously in in in, in uh, I mean in Ukraine, uh, you know the Azov and stuff like that. Uh, in 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 Israel, right? We back these these like fascistic kind of. Uh, Kind of forces even in Hong Kong. So there's there's a long history. Uh, you know, if you look at Libya in 2011, right? We back these like crazy jihadist uh, uh, forces. So there's a long history. It's not just like you know some future the, the Canadian elite are going to have some dalliance with fascism and it's going to be fascism here. They're 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 fascistic right now. Just you know abroad, right? As um, one person said, what uh, fascism is is is. Uh, Imperialist, imperialist um, uh, repression directed internally, right? And so, so in doing that, in, in framing and sort of domesticizing this whole thing that a lot of lefties have done, they they lose sight. You know, okay, we're worried about this sometime down the road fascism in Canada. Well, <laughs> we should be concerned about that current day Canadian government uh, fascism abroad. Um. Another thing that came out of all this uh, is the whole uh, couple of things quickly before getting to comments and questions is um, is uh, the reaction of this whole disinformation. So CBC had a piece titled Opposition Disinfo Experts Push Government to Fight Russian Propaganda in Wake of Honka Incident. So they just frame this as all Russian propaganda. Of course, Trudeau did that, as I mentioned. Uh, and they got Marcus Kolga. Marcus Kolga has been saying this for years, right? If you go book, go back and look at Marcus Kolga from the McDonald and Laurie Institute. He he uh, he's the disinfo expert, right? Uh, I was just reading uh, uh, David Puglesi's piece from 2020 in Esprit du Corps about where he talks about the these SS brought into Canada and gives us some of the background. And and the guy I was just mentioning, um, uh, Bodan Panchuk. He was celebrated, right? It was like a 75th anniversary thing on Global Mail and CBC did for him. He's the guy who brought these the the far right Ukrainians in, led the charge, organizers into Canada, and he was celebrated back in 2020. And so, Puglesi is writing these pieces in his Esplanade call, and and Marcus Kolga, he's quoting Marcus Kolga back then already, saying this is all Russian disinformation. <laughs> you know, this is this is a historical fact. Um, and so you got even Peter Julian. The, the NDP House leader saying, quote, Russia, Russian propaganda is weaponizing this incident to harm President Zelensky. The prime minister has to apologize and help mitigate the harms that this has caused Ukraine and its leadership. Well, Zelensky's all around. It's example after example of Z you, you, Zelensky back in 2021 actually condemned the, the 14th uh, SS uh, uh, Waffen uh, division. But in recent time, he has repeatedly just I saw something on Twitter about this yesterday he's like he's like rehabilitating all these far-right forces right so yeah apologize to Zelensky but apologize for what exactly um 
Now, the Globe today has a good piece uh, titled University of Alberta Faces Calls to Return More Donations Linked to Waffen SS Veterans. Now, their 30,000 donation endowment under uh, Honka's name was they've announced they were going to return that. Um, uh, but in this story, and this has been circulating on Twitter now for a few days, but the story, the Globe story really brings it all together, I think, quite, quite well. Um, I'm sure there's much, many more details, though, uh, and, uh, you know, in addition, but they got a lot of a lot of good details in the story. And they the they talk about all these different endowments to former um, uh, Nazi and uh, Nazi soldiers at the at the uh, Ukrainian studies department there at um, at the University of uh, Alberta, including four hundred thirty thousand dollars in the name of Volodymyr Kubajovich, I believe. Uh, and uh, and he's uh, he's like the leader of setting up this this division, right? This is like a serious, you know, high player in in uh, in Nazi circles, and uh, they have a big endowment for him, and they go through a whole bunch of these examples, smaller amounts of money, and um, and then they talk about like Peter Peter Severin, who was also one of these Waffen SS guys. Uh, so Honka's at the low. Honka was like a sixteen or seventeen, a young guy when he joins. Uh, you know, not a, he's not a player. He's just, he's just a low, low order soldier. Uh, these other guys are like higher, higher players. Right. Um, so if you're going to give the money back for, for Hunka, you should definitely be doing it for the other players who are clearly much more culpable. And, um, uh, so Peter Saverin was one of these former Waffen SS who he actually became, he gets an order of Canada. He's the chancellor of the University of Alberta, becomes a chancellor in the mid 1980s. Um, he was a big player within the conservative party in Alberta. And now this, this has a, it, you know, the, 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 the University of Alberta's Ukrainian studies is the second Ukrainian studies set up anywhere in the world. Just like, I think it's like two years after it's, I think it's in 1976 and set up. I think the, the Harvard one gets set up in two years before that or something like that. And this is really important. This is a big impact on Ukrainian politics. Obviously, there was no, it wasn't, you know, this was part of the USSR at the time. Uh, during his speech in the House of Commons, uh, Zelensky talks about how the, the first monument to the Holodomor, uh, the alleged uh, genocidal famine, uh, against the, that the Soviets imposed on Ukrainians, alleged um, the first monuments in Canada in Alberta. And this the, the University of Alberta's Ukrainian Studies Institute is really the, a pusher of this, central to this whole uh, formulation. Now, basically, my understanding is that, is that the, the idea of the Holodomor is basically to give these former Nazi-aligned Ukrainian soldiers the justification for, you know, basically we aligned with the Nazis who carried out this, this, this Holocaust against Jewry, um, but we, we were caught between, you know, bad, bad on both sides. Our, the Ukrainians had been genocided by the, by the uh, USSR beforehand, and there's this famine, and, and so we, you know, we were just sort of a justification for their pro-Nazism. Now, the famine did happen, and it was horrible, and the, certainly the Soviet leadership deserves lots of blame for the, for the forced uh, coll uh, agricultural collectivization, but the, the ethnic component is, is highly dubious. It took place in other parts of the USSR as well. Um, so it's being basically framed as this sort of Moscow, the horrible Moscow imposing this on Ukrainians um, isn't, doesn't hold, right? Yes, it was horrible. Yes, the impact was terrible. Yes, there's lots of uh, blame that the, the very um, centralized and repressive nature of the, of the Soviet system, uh, uh, you know, explains there's all kinds of other factors, whether there's opposition by landlord, and there's all kinds of other factors that go into it. Um, but certainly there's blame deserved to the, to the Soviet leadership, but it's not a genocidal endeavor. 
And, and it, when you look at the University of Alberta's Ukrainian studies, this is like literally the people financing this, the, the, the people set up the Ukrainian studies. These are the people, these are the ones who fought with the Nazis, who, are, who, are, who have a self-interest, a very clear self-interest in creating this, this argument. And you've seen it repeatedly in recent days that while well, they were caught between terrible situation, you know, you, you had the, the, the genocidal Holodomor on one side, uh, by the Soviets, and then you had uh, Hitler's, uh, 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 you know, trying to wipe out European Jewry on the other side. Um, so, so that's um, I think important to to uh, to look at to consider. And um, I, I want to be done for pretty close to seven, so I'm, I'm going to maybe just mention one uh, one or two final things. Um, the Maple has a story called "Is Christian Freeland a Fraud or a Nazi Sympathizer?" Where it looks at the idea that Christian Friedman would, wouldn't have known when when the speaker said this was like uh, this person fought against Russia during World War II, uh, as if Christian Friedman wouldn't have known what that meant. Um, worth taking a look at. Also, the fact that the head of the DND, who is right next to Honka, is standing up celebrating, uh, uh, and uh, he has not uh, uh, he has not apologized uh, for for doing so. And then finally, Joe, Joe Emmersberger has a tweet where he says, uh, if you relied on Maude Barlow's timeline to inform yourself about Canada, you would not know about Nazigate scandal, that our entire parliament plus Zelensky gave a standing ovation to a Nazi. Similarly, Naomi Klein and Linda McQuaig, uh, they, I guess they haven't touched it. They hadn't, as of this point, touched it either. Maude Barlow, I, I have to say, I think I've mentioned this previously, she's a total fanatic. Uh, the former head of the council, kind of total NATO proxy war fanatic, and uh, and, uh, and, uh, and 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 continues to be clearly. Now, uh, just to uh, to conclude, uh, there was the first two mobilizations. I think in Toronto and maybe Winnipeg uh, yesterday. I think there's one today, and then there's uh, more protests throughout this week, and then here in Montreal on, on Sunday as part of the global mobilization for peace in Ukraine. And then the other thing I just want to mention really quickly is that if people have, I, I'm gonna, I did an interview with, um, I, I interviewed um, Richard Sanders, who did the really important reports on Canadian support for far right uh, uh, fascist Eastern European groups, uh, which you can see on my YouTube and on the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute, Institute YouTube. One of the things I thought about doing was maybe trying to do some debates. So get people who, who you know, disagree and just maybe not as part of the Canadian Foreign Policy Hour, but just reach out to them and ask, hey, will you want to come on and we'll have a 40 minute hour debate. Anyways, if there's any individuals that people can think of that are on dealing with Canadian foreign policy issues that they think might want to debate me or it might make sense for me to reach out to them to debate uh, or just, you know, sort of good debates that people are, you know, would like to hear or whatever. Um, that was just one thought I had to maybe uh, to, uh, to do. Uh, so please just email me if you have any ideas. Obviously, if you have a person's contact, if you have their name, if you've actually reached out to them, even better. You know, the more closer to be, it being realizable, the better. Uh, but uh, yeah, just email them with that. And um, and uh, if people have comments and questions, I know, I think I saw Laura. Laura you, you messaged me saying she wasn't sure she's was going to be able to get on. Uh, but I think I just saw her. Uh, but I'll, I see some hands. So as we're waiting, I'll just go with... Uh, uh, Oh yeah, I do see Laura. Uh, go, but yeah, go ahead. Uh, go ahead, Nadia. Yes, hello. Uh, thank you, Eve, uh, for this presentation. There's something I don't understand. Uh, I think um, Dimitri Lascaris had mentioned that officially the Parliament of um, Ukraine has officially honored and recognized a uh, well-known. Uh, fascist, um, what do you call him? Uh, 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 I, I forget his name, but- uh, and Bandera and the like. Yeah, yeah right, right, right. Now, why isn't this well known in Canada? How, is it, how come they don't talk about it? And the other- uh, well, Hon Honka was also, Honka got, got uh, made an honorary citizen of Bre Breshny, the city. Uh, along uh, back in 2007 or something like that, alongside Bandera and uh, Melnik later on. Yeah, so it's happening all across Ukraine. It's, it's but nobody talks about this uh, Bandera who is honored and has a statue 
uh, honored by, by the parliament itself. So how come, you know, um, uh, Zelensky is brushed with the, with the white uh, banner? You know, I don't understand. That's one thing. The other thing is that you mentioned several times that can, Canadian foreign policy is subject to capitalism and anybody who tries in any way, shape or form to change that. In other words, it's, it's, a, it, it, it's a fascist foreign uh, policy. So wh why don't we target the billionaires who are behind the, 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 the kind of policies that we have in, uh, in Canada? Why aren't we targeting them? We didn't never talk about the billionaires who are using our governments as puppets. Uh, well, I think we do talk about the billionaires. I mean, I certainly talk about it in with regards to um, to the mining sector, with regards to you know Canada's climate policy. Obviously, the billionaires are very central to shaping that. Um, the think tanks and stuff like that, the billionaires fund. Um, but I all you know, I think also it is a little bit more complicated than just the billionaires. Uh, the influence of the U.S. empire. Uh, sometimes the billionaires want, you know, the, the whole anti-China thing. A lot of the billionaires actually don't want that. They they want to just make money in China. Um, but no, I I don't think I I completely agree. We're not we're not gonna we're not gonna fundamentally change Canadian foreign policy so long as we live in a deeply inegalitarian. Uh, society i mean the, the the you know wealth <laughs> concentration shapes our politics across the board from ownership of media to think tanks to universities to on and on and on uh so i i you know we need economic democracy uh if we're going to want if we're going to have a, a, a you know a justice more just kind of foreign policy but Okay, so Eve, Sally's next, but before we do that, because we, we've got so little time and you have a hard stop at seven, so maybe everyone could keep their questions and comments pretty succinct, so to give everyone a chance. So go ahead, Sally. Um, Eve, I'm just wondering if you can comment a little bit more about Christia Friedland and if this you feel like this uh, Nazi gate might tarnish her a little bit about her connections to the UCC and um, you know, the history with her grandfather, also her NATO head aspirations, do you know where that's going? And is, is, is she still a viable candidate to maybe succeed uh, Trudeau? Or is she starting to wear a bit thin, do you think, with the public? Yeah, I do think this tarnishes her. I think it does. There's enough, like, sort of, the media mostly ignores it, uh, but it, it, it sort of gets around enough. Um, uh, she is very connected to UCC. You know, did she know Hunker? I don't know. Uh, was she involved in? I I will. I really wanted to find her at an event and at, just ask the question. Christian, did you invite the Nazi uh, 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 on on video? But um, I guess it still could be done. But I've looked for her. She hasn't been in Montreal since. But um, uh, I, I, uh, you know, I, I don't, I think her NATO thing is not going to happen because there's real reluctance for a North American to be the head of NATO. That's, that's against the tradition. Uh, uh, so um, I think she still could be, I don't think this has tarnished her to the point of not being the, the, the uh, leader of, uh, you know, becoming the next uh, head of the Liberal Party. Um, but yeah, her, her grandfather, of course, is a Nazi propagandist. Um, I, I think one of the things that, you know, when I was talking about, I'm just writing this, one of the things when we talk about this whole, like the left hyping the, 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 um, the sort of, uh, fascistic, um, policy domestically and downplaying it internationally, Christian Freeland is a perfect example of that. Christian Freeland and her family, obviously her grandpa, uh, her mom was also a real Ukrainian nationalist. But her mom was like this. She set up like a feminist bookstore. She was in 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 uh, in Edmonton, and she was uh, she was an NDP uh, candidate. Christian Freeland also, when it comes to domestic policy, you know, she's like a like liberalish kind of 
you know, she's not a she's not a fascist in any serious way on domestic policy. But when you look at what she's done internationally, she's clearly and the same thing with her mom, like that her mom was involved in writing the Ukrainian constitution. Apparently, uh, there's this thing passage in the Ukrainian constitution about maintaining the the uh, Ukrainian gene pool. So it's got like all kinds of stuff about like sort of, you know, liberal, whatever, but also includes stuff about maintaining the Ukrainian gene pool. Um, so her mom was involved in that uh, uh, process. So it's kind of an interesting, the family in some ways, I think is an interesting example of this sort of uh, kind of fascistic in their foreign outlook. And, and when it comes to sort of uh, at home, um, you know, believe in sort of liberal, whatever kind of, um, um, but yeah, I, I don't know, you know, Freeland, there's this clip of her being asked uh, about there because there's part of that report from the mid 1980s that was never released about the, uh, the former uh, Nazi uh, forces in Canada. And, uh, and she was asked about that. That's one of the pushes that's going on right now, which I, of course, think should happen. They should release that. They, they, you know, I mean, my bar for government releasing a government documents is very, very low bar. And clearly this bar surpasses that threshold. Um, this whole business of government secrecy is, you know, cabinet should have like three weeks of secrecy and then release the documents. But anyways, but that's a broader thing. So, so, so that's a good, she was very uncomfortable. Um, it might have stuff about, you know, her, her grandfather in there. Um, uh, but uh uh, yeah, I don't I don't think this at this point, I don't think this is like, um, you know, this is not the end of Christian Freeland's career or anything like that. Um, but it, it, it definitely uh, is not a, a good moment for her. Hey, Yuri, go ahead. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Perfect. Uh, Eve, I just wanted your response to uh, this. This is from uh, Politico, an opinion piece. Fighting against the USSR doesn't necessarily make you a Nazi. Canada's Hunka scandal is a demonstration of how when history is complicated, it can be a gift of propagandists who exploit the appeal of simplicity. And I think you already sort of like addressed that, but but yeah, I just wanted you know your thoughts on that because there are many because you know, like with the uh you know, the Holodomor uh you know, myth, half truth. There are a lot of people trying to spin. Well, hey, you know, communism, USSR is just as bad as the Nazis, and therefore Stepan Bandera and so forth had to you know, collaborate. So I'm curious your your response on that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that they're basically the real Nazis are the Russians. Uh, that's the that's the kind of argument that that's that political piece was making, and it's some some fanatic anti-Russian that wrote that. And variations of that are all around. Um, that uh, James Clayton, I believe, he 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 shows that if you look at the the um, uh, the the Ukrainian nationalist publications like Banderas and Melnik's publication, uh, they um, back in the twenties, so before the Nazis come to power, in uh, they're very anti-Semitic already. Right there, there are they're like it's not it's there's not just the the Nazis you know forces on them and and they went about massacring Poles and Jews and you know Russians whatever they they were they were national they were far right nationalists at the time and and anti you know they wanted a homogenous their sense of homogenous state and all that kind of stuff they they he 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 says that their publication you obviously go gets more extreme with the Nazis, uh, you know, rise in Germany, and that influences far right parties all around, you know, Europe and Eastern Europe, whatever, of course, but but it's there already clearly in the 1920s. Uh, um, so uh, uh, yeah, and, and um, uh, I mean, the, the again, the main to me, the big thing out of this is this was this was about anti Russia, that was this is what, like, Caitlin Johnson, I quoted her, what's the title of her piece is like uh, joking about uh, Rhoda. He's like, he, he couldn't imagine that anyone who, who fought Russians uh, could be bad, right? That was, that's why he invited Hunka, because it's like, hey, well, anyone who fought Russians, I mean, this has got to be, now, the Nazi bit for him was just a little bit of an aside, right? It was just like, you know, he was fighting Russians, he's got to be a good guy. And, uh, and that's what this is, 
this is this what this, this is the you know central element in understanding all this, and that's of course being obscured and and this kind of piece in political further uh, you know does that. But. Okay, go ahead, Philip. Hi, um, it's my understanding that in Ottawa they're building a memorial to the victims of communism. Well, isn't that just a, another trying to control the narrative or create a narrative about, again, with the whole Russia phobia thing, and also that there's far right people as in organizations contributing to that. Uh, so isn't it really just another continuation of um, the Ukrainian Nazis and all that who are contributing to that? Just another, actually, this is a government funded uh monument to commemorate you know ukrainian nazis and the far right in this country and on the discussion you know when you say nazism or communism is bad well there was also another force during that time in world war ii colonialism britain and france were colonial powers you know africa uh you know asia the middle east were all colonies of either france or britain or you know the belgians or whatever and the Americans uh, had the Monroe Doctrine in Latin America, so maybe in the, here in Canada, how we, you know, treat the Indigenous people, maybe instead of a monument to communism or a victim to communism, maybe we should have a monument to the victims of colonialism and imperialism in this country, because again, uh, that's something that affects our history more than victims of communism. And it's addressing a problem that's in our country, you know. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I agree. I think it is designed that monument is designed to uh, basically uh, lay the terrain for sort of whitewashing what the Nazis did indirectly. And I, um, Joe Emmersberger, I, I haven't read Mein Kampf, but Joe Emmersberger uh, did a review of Mein Kampf about uh, a few months ago, which I I, re, I wrote I read. Uh, Initially, and I reread uh, just a couple of days ago, and his his point is that Mein Kampf is like basically a glorif glorification of imperialism, and that he he loved British Hitler loved British uh, uh, colonialism, and of course what the Germans did to the to the Herero uh, in uh, in uh, in West Africa, um, uh, the genocide that they perpetrated. That's you know part of the 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 uh, the, uh, the sort of um, the, the later you the you know, later use against uh, against uh, jury and and other groups in uh, in Europe. Okay, now Eve, we have one last yeah, hand. Yeah, like yeah, real quick, okay. Alan, if possible. Uh, am I on now? Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, I don't know whether everyone here today has had the opportunity to have traveled as extensively as I have, but in 1980, I was traveling in Europe and uh, I uh, was at uh, in Potsdam uh, and uh, was at the Cecilhof Palace where the final negotiations of the Second World War took place, ending on July 31st. And uh, uh, Harry Truman uh, kind of hinted a, a little bit to Stalin about them having the second or having the um, atomic bomb, and of course filled Churchill right in uh, as much as possible uh, about having the atomic bomb and the intention to use it. And because of the way the negotiations went, that. Uh, uh, Harry Truman could not uh, get Stalin to see the quote unquote right way of uh, divvying up uh, Eastern Europe at the end of the Second World War. Um, this, uh, in my opinion, is the reason why six days later the first atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima. Furthermore, on that same trip, I happened to be traveling. To, I was in Oslo, Norway, and uh, the pension that I stayed in uh, just happened that there was only myself and an old timer there uh, who um, liked to talk a lot. And he had been in the organization which 
1947 uh, became the uh, uh, became the CIA. And he was telling me that um, uh, the discussions went around uh, taking all of those um, Nazi soldiers that fled to the West and uh, mar turning them around and marching on Moscow. And this is frankly what Winston Churchill wanted to do. But of course, the status of the Soviet Union in the world at that point in time was of such that that kind of attempt would have fallen flat on its face, and so be it, it never happened. But uh, that's just one, I know we're out of time. I have a lot, I happen to be a, a history buff as well, and would have a lot to say on this particular presentation by Eves. And I uh, thank you very much because I found it to be excessively interesting, just like most of the other ones as well. So yeah, thank you, Eves. Yeah. yeah, thanks, Alan. And yeah, no, I think that obviously they, there was a short period where there was a sort of uh, an allied with the USSR, but clearly we wanted uh, forces within, you know, Ukraine and, and other Eastern European USSR and Eastern European that would undermine the USSR. We went to we tried to undermine it right away. Now, the question I have is that it's not just about the USSR. It's about U.S. global domination, right? Even after the USSR is gone, they still want to weaken Russia, and that makes sense to me as the as a competitor to the U.S. Um, uh, the U.S. wants to weaken that country and would like to break up Russian Federation if they could. And uh, so it's not just about the you know a lot of people say, well, it's because of communist, but I don't think it's just about that. It was that's part of it, but it's the just that the U.S. wants no country that is a, a is a you know challenges it and russia to to a certain extent challenges us domination but uh on that note uh thanks uh everyone again there's there's protests uh, in many different cities um and if you can uh, try to get out to those uh to those protests in the coming days take care everyone thanks